Okay, you should have permission. No, I think it's good now. It's good brilliant. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we'd like to welcome Bob Yonkin to this week's uh, non commissioned Geometry and Topology Seminar from uh, Université de Clermont Auvergne. And the title of the talk is The Groupoid Approach to Pseudo Differential Operators. Beautiful. Uh, so thank you very much, Ray, and thanks to all for the invitation. Um, it's great to be back in Prague. Uh, so the goal here, as it clearly says in the title, is to um, describe a new way of constructing pseudo differential operators by using groupoids. And the, the goal is basically to make the science of pseudo differential operators, um, well, in a certain way simpler, that was my main goal at least, um, and in, in any case certainly to make it more geometric and algebraic. Um, and this is following in the, the great work of um, Alan Kahn and uh, Claire de Boer and Georges de Condalis. Uh, so we'll get to talking about all of that in due course, but uh, the place to start, so I'll start, uh, uh, okay, I does not want to, sorry, and just make sure that this is working, it was working before. No, no, it doesn't want to work. I don't understand why. Um, sorry, I'm just going to fiddle with this a bit to see whether this changes anything. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, so let's start by talking about uh, ellipticity and hypoellipticity, which is the motivation for all this work. Um, so here's the situation. So you probably know this all very well, but let's start there just to get warmed up. So uh, M is going to be a smooth manifold without boundary, perhaps compact uh, if I, I want to make things even nicer. Uh, and P is going to be a differential operator on M. And we define P to be elliptic if its principal symbol is an invertible in the sense of being outside the, the smooth, uh, invertible outside the zero section. Uh, so what does that mean precisely? So here's the example to illustrate this. So I choose some uh, differential operator, linear differential operator on R2. Uh, and um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, take the principal co symbol or just principal part, which is just the highest degree part. In this case, this is minus d by dx squared minus d by dy squared, a Laplacian. And then I take the Fourier transform of that to get the principal symbol, uh, which is this function sky squared plus eta squared, which is obviously non zero uh, as long as psi and eta are non zero and so I see it's invertible. So this is an example of an elliptic differential operator. And the second definition, which is also important, is uh, hypoellipticity. So P is hypoelliptic if uh, it satisfies this smoothness of solutions condition. So if I have uh, a distribution F and PF is a C infinity function, then F was already a C infinity function. And that's true not just on all of them, but uh, on any open set. So it, it's basically saying that uh, if I have a, a, a differential equation with the right-hand side being smooth, then the solutions are smooth as well. Okay, and you can see the uh, similarity in the, the, the words uh, of these two definitions, ellipticity and hypoellipticity, but the actual definitions don't seem to have much to do with each other, uh, unless, of course, you know this famous well-known theorem that elliptic operators are hypoelliptic. And in fact, this is one of the main properties, of course, of elliptic operators. Uh, and why they're so interesting. Um, so uh, let's prove that, since this is central to everything we're doing here. Um, so the the proof, the the way you, the modern proof for proving the elliptic operators are hypoelliptic, is to uh, construct a pseudo differential calculus. So what does this mean? So this means we're going to introduce a filtered algebra of operators, psi m. Uh, there are operators both on smooth functions and on distributions on this manifold uh, with the following three properties. For the, so the first is that I wanted to contain the differential operators. So it's some kind of enlargement of the algebra of differential operators. Uh, the second thing is that all the Schwartz kernels of these operators should be C infinity off the diagonal. And basically what that means is that when you apply one of these operators, then it won't increase the singular support. It may increase the support. So a, a different, just to remind you, a differential operator doesn't increase the support. One of these pseudo differential operators won't increase the singular support. Uh, and the final thing that I need is that it contains uh, parametrices for the elliptic differential operators. So a parametrics Q for an operator P is one such that I minus PQ and I minus QP are smoothing operators. Uh, and once you have those conditions, so that's the hard work, 
then you simply write your function f, which is uh, a solution to this differential equation, as uh, this sum of i minus qpf and qpf. Uh, and the first part will be smoothed by the fact that it's a parametric, and the second part will be smoothed by the fact that, um, sorry, the second part will not be smooth, but it'll have the same singular support as the right-hand side pf. And that shows that uh, f is uh, smooth on the same uh, same subset of m as pf. And, and so we're done. So you, this explains why a pseudo-differential calculus is a useful thing to have. Uh, and the first consequence is that, as I say, elliptic operators are hyperelliptic. Um, but just to point out, this is far from being uh, 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 an equivalence. There are a lot of hyperelliptic operators that are not elliptic. So here are two examples. The first is from 1934 in a paper by Kolmogorov, who introduced uh, this operator here, uh, d by dx squared plus x d by dz plus d by dy on R3. Uh, if you think of R3 here as being um, the Heisenberg group, then this is this operator is in fact uh, x squared, the vector field associated to the standard field x, uh, x squared plus y. Uh, and Kolmogorov showed that this is also a hyperelliptic operator, but clearly it's very far from being elliptic. Its principal part is just d by dx squared, so its symbol will just be psi squared, which on R3 is zero uh, on an entire hyperplane. So this is far from being elliptic, but nonetheless it's hyperelliptic. And uh, another example, which might be more um, uh, interesting to people who are working on things like parabolic manifolds, parabolic geometries, and things like this, is the example. So the following example, you take a strongly pseudo-convex domain uh, in uh, Cn plus 1, and you take the manifold to be the boundary of this. So this is a 2n plus 1 dimensional manifold. It's actually a CR manifold, a particular contact manifold. Um, <coughs> And now uh, inside that we have a hyperplane bundle, a contact hyperplane bundle called H, which is all the tangent vectors which remain tangent when multiplied by I. Uh, and we can define what's called a sub Laplacian, which is the sum of the Xi squareds, but now where Xi is just a local frame for H and not for all of Tn. So this is if you like, elliptic in all dimensions, all directions, but one. It's elliptic in 2n of the 2n plus 1 directions, but then there's another direction which is not uh, introduced. But nonetheless, as Cohn and then Follin and Stein and many other people uh, have shown, um, this retains the property of being hyperelliptic thanks to the geometry of this hyperplane bundle, which is somehow totally non-integrable. It's, it's the opposite of being a foliation, so that the vector fields are long this hyperplane bundle H uh, generate all the vector fields, and that turns out to be enough for this to be hyperelliptic. Okay, so those are kind of the examples that are motivating the work that I'll talk about later on. But I want to start really in the elliptic world to explain the general philosophy. Uh, and to do that, we need to talk about groupoids and Schwartz kernels. So again, I'm sure that many of you know about Kohn's tangent groupoid, but this is really the star of the show. So it's um, very important that I introduce him uh, correctly. Uh, so this is a, a groupoid with um, base space, so the set of objects is going to be n cross r. Um, and it decomposes as a, a disjoint union, in fact a family of groupoids indexed by this parameter r. So the, the r parameter here will always be called t, little t. Um, and this tangent groupoid decomposes as a family of groupoids uh, indexed by this parameter t. And here's a picture. Uh, so for all the non-zero t, for, for t and r cross, uh, it's just m cross m, the pair groupoid. So I'll describe exactly what the pair groupoid is in a second, but let's just look at it as a, at it as a space for the moment. And the one exception is that the fiber at t equals zero is going to be the tangent space, the tangent bundle to this manifold n. So the picture I have here is the case where m is a circle. And the only thing I want to do is I want to consider these um, m cross m's as being stretched, uh, stretched transversely to the diagonal. So this red line here is supposed to be the diagonal in m cross m. And I'm going to stretch this space uh, transversely to that diagonal. OK, so what's the structure here? So to describe it as a Lie groupoid, I need two pieces of information. I need the Lie structure, that is, I mean, the, the smooth structure, the C-infinity structure, and that's what I'll do first. And then I need the, the algebraic structure, which is the 
the group point structure. So first of all, let's do the geometry. So away from t equals zero, the geometry of this as a manifold is just the product structure of just n cross n cross r times. Um, but an interesting things happen as I tend towards t equals zero, and that's where all the interest in this guy, uh, this tangent group point happens. Uh, and as I said, I'm going to stretch, um, stretch my copies of n cross m transversely to the diagonal so that when I actually get to t equals zero, what I'm going to obtain is actually the normal bundle to the embedding of the diagonal in m cross m. And if you know your geometry, the normal bundle to the diagonal in m cross m is just the tangent bundle, uh, tm. Uh, so this is exactly what we have, and the smooth structure is given by, you know, at t equals zero, the smooth structure is given by the exponential, the geometric exponential. And you can define this exponential in any of several uh, equivalent ways up to C infinity diffeomorphisms. Um, uh, for instance, using a connection to get a, a Riemannian exponential or just using a flow one along vector fields. Um, but the idea is that, uh, so if this psi here, maybe I can draw on this a little bit. Uh, if this psi here is uh, the field, uh, then um, I'm just going to take the, let's say it's the time one flow. It's the time one flow uh, for t non-zero. For the time one flow where the vector field is slowed down by a factor of t, so that as a t tends towards zero, this flow gets slower and slower, and uh, the arrows will therefore be shorter and shorter as I tend towards t equals zero. So that in the limit, when I get to t equals zero, uh, my arrow will be infinitesimally short, which is to say the flow will go nowhere, but I don't want to, to record that as just a, a single point. Did we lose you, Bob? Can't hear either. It's look like. Hmm. Technical difficulties. I think you realize it's like it's neither of you have his like phone number or anything. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I'll send him a quick email just in case. Yeah, okay, so I let you send the email so he doesn't get bombarded. Hopefully he didn't lose his internet connection entirely. Yeah. Meanwhile, I see Andre has turned into a cat. <laughs> that happens during lockdown, anything. Okay, if we want to make a, a, a game, I, I will show my cat too. <laughs> Very nice. Right. If it is a cat contest. This is the best I can do.
And you must know that my cat by now knows a great deal of mathematics because he, she has been to many seminars. <laughs> uh, this cat knows too. Yes, <laughs> it's beautiful, Andre. You have a beautiful cat. It's not mine. <laughs> what do you mean it's not mine? <laughs> Thanks. Does anyone know that if I remove Bob, he could join again? Or will he be banned or something weird like that? Hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure. You, you can try to remove me and I will text you in a uh, Hangout. Seems he disappeared on his own. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can okay. You know. I don't know what happened there. Uh, it seems like the internet connection flaked out on me for a second. And so now you guys are going to have to tell me where we were up to. I'm going to share my screen again. Sorry about that. Still the tangent group points. So, um, so where were we? Tangent group points. Yeah, yep. we were here. So had I done the um, the smooth structure and the groupoid structure, or just the smooth structure, or nothing at all, or just the smooth structure. smooth structure? Yeah. Sorry, I I'd done the smooth structure. So we talked about uh, we talked about this. Yep. Okay, so let me just fiddle with this to make sure that I can plug through here again. Uh, what's it giving to me here? Uh, that's why I don't know why it needs me to play with things before. I move. Okay, here we go. So we talked about the smooth structure, but we didn't talk about the group void structure. Is that what we're saying? Uh, you were interrupted in the middle of smooth structure. You was explaining what is the vector field. Uh, okay. At zero. Okay, so uh, the I'll do the short version of that then. So uh, this psi here uh, is supposed to be a uh, a vector field. And uh, the smooth structure, so the, the structure is a C infinity manifold, is such that um, uh, the exponentials uh, of this vector field uh, give uh, charts on this manifold where, um, okay, the exponential can be interpreted, for instance, as a time one flow. But the important thing is that factor of t before the xi, uh, which, um, which means that the vector field is going to be slowed down in time as t goes to zero. So for a t finite, uh, this exponential map will give a flow from one point to another. And then you should think of that flow as being uh, a, a, an arrow in this groupoid, a morphism in this groupoid. Uh, but as t goes to zero, this arrow will become zero in length or infinitesimal in length, because I don't want to think of it as a zero length arrow from one point to itself. I want to think of it as uh, an infinitesimal arrow from that point to itself, namely a tangent vector. And this all glues together smoothly to give uh, a C infinity structure on this, uh, on this manifold. Uh, so I, I'm guessing now that I got cut off because I tried to use my stylus. I don't know why the stylus uh, cut the, the, the feed, but um, I'll have to avoid using that just to be safe so it doesn't happen again. I'd love to ask you to tell me if I get cut off again, but something tells me that it doesn't work. Uh, now I need to talk about the groupoid structure, so the algebraic structure of this guy. So that, as you know, groupoids 
uh, not every two elements of a groupoid is composable. Uh, so the first rule in this groupoid is that things will only be composable if they live in the same fiber. Uh, and even then there are restrictions, so the same T fiber. So here's what we do. If uh, two things are in the same non-zero T fiber, uh, then it means we have two pairs and the composition law is just the pair groupoid law. So XY times YZ is equal to XZ. Uh, so an arrow from x to y composes with an arrow from y to z to give an arrow from x to z, the unique arrow from x to z. And at t equals zero, the group void law is just the group law where I see the tangent space at x as being an abelian group. So it's merely addition of tangent vectors. And these are the only allowable compositions in this group void of columns. Uh, okay, so first of all, do you still hear me? Yes. Yes. Right. Okay, I'm gonna ask you this regularly so that I don't waste another five minutes talking to myself. Um, right, so now that we've got a groupoid, uh, as in the previous slide, we can now talk about uh, an algebra of, convolution algebra of distributions. So just as on a Lie group, you can convolve distributions, so you can convolve distributions on a groupoid. And uh, let's give the motivation for this with the Schwartz kernel theorem. So I wanna consider a continuous operator from C infinity M to C infinity M. So Schwartz's theorem says that these are given by Schwartz kernel integral operators. In general, I mean the, the standard formulation of the Schwartz kernel theorem is for functions from C infinity M to distributions, D prime M, and then you can take any distributional kernel. But in this case, I'm being more stingy. I want my operator to map C infinity M to C infinity M again, and that means the Schwartz kernel is gonna have to be smooth already in one of the two variables uh, in the normal way and the normal parameterization that'll be the first variable. And so that I'm gonna use this notation E prime R of M cross M to mean distributions on M cross M, which are smooth in the first variable and then distributional in the second variable. Okay, and uh, what's more, uh, the composition of two of these Schwartz kernel operators is given by this standard formula. And I want to see this as a, a convolution law. In fact, it's precisely a convolution law, but it's a convolution law with respect to the pair group one. You can see exactly the, the composition in the pair groupoid that I described on the previous slide there, that x times y, sorry, xy times yz is equal to xz. Okay, and you can do this more generally. So um, for any Lie groupoid, you can define an e prime r of g, which will be c infinity families of distributions on the range fibers of g. So in the pair groupoid, for instance, the range fibers, uh, the range map is the projection onto the first coordinate. So I'm talking about uh, distributions on the second, in, with respect to the second variable here. And I want these distributions in the second variable to make a C infinity function uh, into the distributions with respect to the first variable. So this is precisely what I've described at the top of this slide. And then I want some proper support condition just so that the distributions, convolution of distributions is well defined, just like on a Lie group you need proper support, uh, compact support in order to be able to convolve to distributions. Um, and so the Skill, Monchon and Vassou uh, have proved that this E prime G is indeed a convolution algebra. Uh, and what's more that the smooth functions are a right ideal in this. And I could do exactly the same thing with the source fibers and then I get infinity as a left ideal. And, uh, and I can even take the intersection of these to get a two-sided ideal. So this is the sort of analytic structure related to the tangent groupoid. And uh, let's look at an example of this. So uh, let's take a differential operator P of order M. And what I'm gonna consider first is the, the principal part. So we throw away all the lower order, all the terms of order M minus one or lower. And then I'm gonna freeze the coefficients in a particular X to get a constant coefficient linear differential operator on Rn. Once I've frozen coefficients, this can no longer be on anything but Rn. It's not an operator on M anymore. Uh, and if it's a constant coefficient operator on Rn, that's the same thing as saying it's uh, in the universal enveloping algebra of Rn. And of course, this Rn identifies with the tangent space so that I have uh, Px being an element of the universal enveloping algebra of this uh, abelian group Tmx, which lies in the distributions. So elements of the enveloping algebra are distributions supported at zero of the identity element in this group. Okay, so what I've got here is precisely a, a smooth family of compactly supported distributions on the tangent fibers in the tangent bundle. 
which is an element of my E'R from the previous slide, but now it's not E'R for the pair groupoid, it's E'R of the tangent bundle. <coughs> me. You hear me still, I presume? Yes. yes. Fantastic. Okay, so um, now we've got two things with our differential operator. On the one hand, we've got a Schwartz kernel, which is a distribution on M cross M. And on the other hand, we've got a principal co-symbol, which is a distribution on TM. And the magic of, uh, first of all, some comments about this uh, principal co-symbol, excuse me, uh, that it also has a convolution, uh, as we know, and it's compatible with the composition of differential operators, so the principal part of the product of a pair of differential operators is the convolution of the principal parts of those operators. And uh, this is the magic of con. So con realized that these things can all be fit into one object, namely this tangent groupoid, so that uh, if we're given uh, P, uh, a differential operator, or even more generally a pseudo differential operator, polyhomogeneous of step one, I'll say what that means later on. Um, if we denote little p its kernel, uh, then the following family actually makes uh, a smooth family of distributions on this whole tangent groupoid. So at the t fiber, I'm going to put just t to the m times the Schwartz kernel. And at the zero fiber, I'm going to put the principal symbol. And this makes a smooth family of distributions, which lives in um, this uh, E prime R convolution algebra of, um, of, uh, of here. It's of um, Le Skew, Monchon, and Vassou. Uh, although Con, of course, had uh, thought of this well before their work. Um, and uh, so Con's idea was to use this deformation to give uh, an ingenious new proof of the Atiyah Singer index theorem, uh, which is a theorem precisely uh, describing uh, the index of an elliptic operator on M, so which happens at t equals one in this picture, with the K theory of its principal symbol, which happens at t equals zero. Okay, so I won't say any more about that today. Um, but I will say that uh, a more recent uh, uh, realization was made by de Borden Scandalis about this situation, which is not only do the pseudo differential operators sit on this picture, uh, according to Kong, but they can actually be characterized completely in terms of this picture. Um, uh, to characterize them, you need a little bit more information. You need also this one parameter group action. So I'm using R cross plus, so the positive reals as my group. And the action is by this flow. So I simply um, move my copies of M cross M in and out uh, by multiplying by lambda. Uh, so that makes a dilation in the horizontal direction. And because of the way this groupoid is made with this stretching in the vertical direction, as I dilate things in the horizontal direction, there'll be a corresponding stretching in the uh, vertical direction. And that makes this hyperbolic kind of dynamics on this whole picture, where at t equals zero, uh, the group action is just given by dilations, so homothetes, multiplication by lambda on this, on this uh, tangent space. Um, and uh, what de borden scandalis realized, which was really a game-changing observation, is that uh, you can make a precise statement about which are the pseudo-differential kernels. When I say pseudo-differential, I mean, polyhomogeneous of step one again, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in terms of the geometry of this tangent groupoid and this uh, one parameter family of automorphisms of this groupoid. Okay, so I'm not gonna describe exactly de borden scandalis's theorem because it's a little technical to write it down, but I'm gonna describe a new interpretation of it or one that we did with Eric Van Erp. Uh, and which generalizes nicely to all sorts of other situations. And that's really the goal of this talk. Uh, so let's, um, let's do this now. So here's the theorem to characterize the pseudo differential operators on a manifold using the tangent groupoid. So TM is gonna be this tangent groupoid. I'm gonna define a fat psi M um, to be uh, those smooth families of distributions on the tangent groupoid, fat P, which are essentially homogeneous or quasi-homogeneous in this sense that if I push them forward by this uh, de Borde's condolese action, alpha, uh, then I get just lambda to the M times P uh, up to a smooth error. So remember these P's are distributions. Uh, if I were to have 
the difference between alpha lambda star p and lambda to the m p equals zero. That would be purely precisely homogeneous of order m here. I just want it to be smooth, so that makes what I will call essentially homogeneous. And then uh, my normal psi m, so apologies for the subtlety in fonts here, my normal psi m will just be the restriction of such essentially homogeneous guys to the fiber at t equals one. So these are Schwartz kernels. Uh, and then this algebra is precisely the algebra of classical pseudo differential operators, um, polyhomogeneous of step one introduced by Hollander. Um, so this makes an extremely simple geometric algebraic definition of pseudo differential operators requiring almost no analysis at all, just a little bit of knowledge of distributions and what is Kahn's tangent group work. Uh, and voila, you have the you have the, the pseudo differential operators. So I'll give you a proof of this shortly. Um, but uh, the moral of the story is uh, that in order to construct a pseudo differential calculus, he would construct the classical one, but there are many of other, other pseudo differential calculi uh, lying out there. The important thing is to be able to construct a tangent groupoid with an action of R cross plus on it. And then you can take this theorem that I've cited here, instead of being a theorem, you can make it into a definition, call that your pseudo differential operators and check whether it has all the properties that we needed right at the start of this talk to prove, for instance, hyperelliptricity for the uh, operators in your calculus with invertible principles. Um, so for instance, here's another theorem. Uh, if you change uh, Kahn's tangent groupoid for Melrose's, sorry, for Montebo's B groupoid for a manifold with boundary, and I'm not gonna tell you what that is, you can just dream about it. Uh, then what you get out of this same definition will be Meldrose's B-calculus uh, used in the proof of the Atobi Singer index theorem and such other marvelous things. Uh, and for another example, if you take a Ponge or Van Erp's uh, tangent groupoid for a CR or Heisenberg manifold, then what you get out of this is the Heisenberg calculus due to Bills and Greiner or Taylor. Um, so, uh, you know, and because of the the profundity of Kahn's work on the index theorem. There's been a whole industry, 20 years worth, 30 years worth of people constructing tangent groupoids for different kinds of geometric structures. To each one of these tangent groupoids, in theory, there should be uh, an associated pseudo differential calculus. And um, it turns out that this is exactly the case. Uh, we have all sorts of new pseudo differential calculi which come out of this general method. Um, Let's just talk about what you can get out of this and we need principal symbols first. So let's let P be one of these Schwartz kernels. By definition now, this means that P is um, the restriction to T equals one of a fat P for some essentially homogeneous guy on the tangent groupoid. And you can prove a little lemma, which is that if you now restrict this fat P uh, to the T equals zero fiber, uh, it's gonna be independent of the choice of the fat P which extends the normal P, um, at least up to a smooth error. So what this means is that you get a well-defined principal symbol map from pseudo differential operators to this sigma m, this co-simple algebra, where sigma m is the convolution algebra of the t equals zero fiber, that is the tangent bundle here, uh, modulo smooth functions, uh, again, uh, which are homogeneous order m with respect to now just the dilations, because remember on the t equals zero fiber, the con de board, sorry, de board's condolis um, action just becomes the homothetes. Okay, and by Fourier transform, you can now show that this is isomorphic to symphony functions on the cosphere bundle. So that's the normal principal symbol instead of the principal co-symbol. And uh, what's more, uh, you have a very simple exact sequence. If you take the distributions on the tangent groupoid and multiply them by T, uh, the kernel of, no, first of all, that's a, a linear map and an algebra um, homomorphism. Uh, and uh, the, the kernel will just be the restriction at t equals zero where this function t uh, is equal to zero. And uh, so uh, you get a short exact sequence uh, mapping to uh, the distributions on the tangent bundle. And this yields precisely the short exact sequence associated to the principal symbol map. And this is exactly enough to show that if you have an invertible principal symbol, then P has a parametrics modulo order minus one pseudo differential operators in this calculus. Uh, and then by a simple Neumann series trick, there's a standard trick in pseudo differential theory, which lets you push that psi minus one to a psi minus infinity. So it's actually uh, has a parametrics modulo smoothing operators, which is what we needed right at the start. Okay, so this setup is, like I said, it's very simple and it gives uh, many of the standard facts 
about pseudo-differential operators uh, just out of the geometry of this tangent group. Uh, so let's do a proof of this now, but let me just pause to ask firstly whether you still hear me and secondly whether there are any questions. Yes, we can still hear. Wow, okay, from space there. Um, fantastic, so you still hear me and I take it there are no questions because there uh, were no questions. So let's go on. Um, okay, so the goal now I want is to prove this characterization. So let me just remind you what the theorem was. Is this characterization here about pseudo differential operators from being restriction to t equals one of the homogeneous, essentially homogeneous distributions on the tangent record. So uh, let's just recall what a pseudo differential operator is in terms of symbols, full symbols now. So a pseudo differential operator is given by this complicated formula where you take a Fourier transform multiplied by a full symbol A. So apply my P to a U, I take a Fourier transform of U, I multiply by some full symbol A, and then I take the inverse Fourier transform, and um, that defines a pseudo differential operator, as long as my A, so this is not going to work for any old A, I need A belonging to some good symbol class. But let me, before I remind you what the symbol classes are, uh, first say that as is well known, that P is a differential operator if and only if this full symbol A is a polynomial in Xi. And let me remind you also what a polynomial is. So this is what a polynomial is. So a polynomial is a finite sum of homogeneous functions in Xi, smooth homogeneous. So it sends out the only, as you well know, um, the only smooth homogeneous functions on Rn are the polynomials, or the monomials, sorry, the homogeneous polynomials. And so if I take a, a sum of such things, uh, that's going to give me a polynomial, and that will be, say, a strictly polyhomogeneous function uh, in Xi. Okay, so now we want to loosen what we mean by polyhomogeneous. But first of all, we need this symbol class. So SM10, I won't make much of a deal about the rho delta 10 there. Uh, these SM class functions are those uh, verifying certain decay or growth, uh, limiting growth conditions uh, in terms of Xi. And I'm not gonna make a big deal about that either. This is a standard pseudo differential nonsense. Uh, so this is the standard symbol class. But then to make a polyhomogeneous symbol, we want our symbol A to be in this uh, class of reasonable, uh, of reasonably decaying uh, functions on Rn cross Rn, uh, but I want them to admit an asymptotic expansion of this kind written here, so a sum of Aj's up to infinity, where asymptotic expansion here means that uh, A minus some finite partial sum in this series is a symbol class of arbitrarily low order, so of order m minus k here. K large, where the AJs are all homogeneous symbols of order M minus J in, in this parameter Xi outside some compact set. So it's just like being a polynomial, except that homogeneity is relaxed a little bit. It doesn't need to be on the nose anymore on the outside of compact set. And I can take orders which are non integer. Uh, I can take arbitrary real orders and uh, can allow infinite series in them instead of just finite series. Okay, um, so just to remind what homogeneous outside a compact set means, strictly speaking, uh, it's exactly this, that if I dilate A by lambda, then I get lambda to the power of M minus J times A uh, outside of some compact set. So this difference will have compact support. Okay, so that's the definition of a polyhomogeneous symbol. Uh, a little bit of a digression now on polyhomogeneous functions, seeing as they play such an important role here. Um, and there's this little lemma which we discovered actually after we had um, done this work that turns out to be an extremely powerful way of understanding what's going on here, which is that you have the following equivalence uh, for functions. Let's just take smooth functions on Rn for the moment. The first is that A is polyhomogeneous of order M in the terms of asymptotic expansions in the previous slide. And the second is that A is the restriction to t equals one of some function fat a in one dimension higher, so a smooth function now on Rn plus one, which is actually homogeneous, not polyhomogeneous, but just straight up homogeneous of degree m, modulo Schwartz functions, so modulo some Schwartz error. So you should think of this lemma as being the equivalent of, of saying, 
any polynomial on Rn, I can make into a homogeneous polynomial on Rn plus one by adding one more variable, which I'll call T. Uh, and it's well known that you know this is sort of a standard fact in algebraic geometry or whatever. But you can you can homogenize your polynomials just by adding an extra variable into the mix. And that's exactly the same thing that's going on here. Uh, so here, just to be precise, uh, what homogeneous what modular Schwartz means, it means that the dilation of A in terms of lambda now dilating in the Rn plus 1 minus uh, lambda to the power of m times A is a, a Schwartz class function. And so what we see is that uh, uh, polyhomogeneous functions on Rn uh, can be understood much more easily, if you like, if you just expand the dimension by one and say, well, in fact, a polyhomogeneous function is just a homogeneous function, modulo Schwartz, uh, restricted to t equals one. So obviously, if you restrict to t equals one, it's no longer going to be homogeneous on the nose, but uh, it retains some notion of homogeneity in this sense of having asymptotic expansions that we saw on the previous slide. Okay, so what does this mean uh, for our pseudo differential operators? So let's consider the case where m is just Rn to begin with. Uh, so let's take a, a P, which is a classical pseudo differential operator. A is going to be a, its symbol, and P is going to be its Schwartz kernel. So that's just the inverse Fourier transform of that symbol. So as we just said, the symbol A is actually the restriction to t equals one of a smooth function, a homogeneous smooth function in one degree higher. So here I've drawn the psi and t dimensions, but I haven't drawn the x dimension. So the x axis, the, the, the manifold itself, m, is going into or out of the screen. Uh, this is just the cotangent direction and the r direction. And as we saw, um, the fact that this is polyhomogeneous means that it's a restriction to t equals one of some actually homogeneous function on this whole job with respect to this uh, radial dilation action. And now if we take the inverse Fourier transform, well, the inverse Fourier transform replaces infinity with zero and zero with infinity. So that now the dilation action upstairs is going to become this hyperbolic dynamics downstairs. And the Schwartz kernel, uh, little p, will now be the restriction to t equals one of a fat p, which is homogeneous or essentially homogeneous with respect to this new hyperbolic action. Uh, on m cross rn plus one. And this m cross rn plus one with this hyperbolic action is exactly the tangent groupoid in the case of rn uh, with the de Bord scandalis action that we were talking about in the previous pictures. So this is exactly a proof, if you like. Um, and it's a, a, a diagrammatic proof of the, the theorem that we presented before in the case of rn. And of course, this is a local statement. So you can now glue this using local charts uh, onto any manifold you want. Uh, so yeah, so this, I'm just repeating the theorem here. This is the theorem we've just proved with those sketches. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so that's the end of the proof for um, the classical calculus. And now we can talk about uh, more general pseudo differential calculi on other manifolds. And here I'm gonna take the example of filter manifolds. I need to tell you what a filtered manifold is to begin with. So a filtered manifold or a manifold with Lie filtration or a Carnot manifold, these are all synonyms more or less for the same thing, is a, a manifold M uh, with a filtration of its tangent bundle by subbundles. Uh, so I've called them here T0M, T1M up to TNM. This proves that I'm not a parabolic geometer because if I were a parabolic geometer, these indices would be negative instead of positive. Okay, let's uh, not worry about that. Uh, uh, with uh, compatible, which are compatible. So I want this filtration to be compatible with uh, Lie bracket of vector fields. So that if I have a vector field of order i and a vector field of order j, then their Lie bracket is of order at most i plus j. And uh, okay, so this is the kind of thing that you find. Uh, well, first of all, some examples. The cl classical manifold is just where you have uh, order zero only, uh, and a Heisenberg manifold. Of for instance, a contact manifold, you'll have uh, depth one filtration here. And uh, in general, parabolic geometries might give you more uh, higher order filtrations. Here. But let me come back to that in a sec. Let me first give you a fundamental calculation about uh, these structures, which is that I have, if I have a vector field uh, x of order i and a vector field y of order j, and two smooth functions f and g, then uh, the Lie bracket of fx uh, with gy will be fg times the Lie bracket of xy, plus some terms which are lower order, 
in this filtration. So that if I pass to the quotient, that is if I pass to the associated graded, uh, I find that uh, the Lie bracket on sections of the associated graded bundle, so I'm going to call the associated graded bundle Lie G N, uh, this inherits a Lie bracket which is not just uh, well defined uh, in terms of the filtration, but it's actually C infinity M linear in both variables meaning that it's tensorial so it's it's just a pointwise bracket so what that means is that now this uh, bundle tm is not just uh, it's not just a bundle but it's actually a bundle of milpotent lie algebras uh, because they inherit each of them these pointwise uh, brackets okay and the associated um, simply connected milpotent lie groups uh, called the osculating groups in this entire job this entire bundle is called the osculating groupoid so in the classical case this will be the tangent bundle just the groupoid of uh, abelian tangent groups uh, but in more general cases i can have a bundle of heisenberg groups or some other bundle of uh, milpotent Lie groups okay so um, now i want to talk about the analog of ellipticity in this situation so invertible principal symbol so let's take one of these filtered manifolds and a differential operator on it now uh, if i freeze the coefficients of this differential operator in this uh, uh, sense of a filtered manifold that means uh, basically what i'm going to do is take the uh, quotient and the associated graded and so i'll get a section of these universal enveloping algebras uh, so this is the new notion of the principal part of the frozen coefficient operator. Uh, and instead of asking this to be invertible in the sense of Fourier and transform, which is the sense for an elliptic operator, I'm going to ask that it be invertible in the sense of representation theory of simply connected Newpotent Lie groups. So P is called a Rockland operator. You could call it a generalized elliptic operator if you wanted to. If at every point X we have for every non-trivial unitary representation pi of this uh, osculating group, the representation of Px, which is an element of the universal enveloping algebra, is invertible on the space of smooth vectors in this representation. So for an elliptic operator where uh, the filtration is trivial and the Lie groups are abelian, this is precisely the Fourier transform. And the condition we're applying is that the Fourier transform be invertible away from the trivial representation, that is away from zero. But uh, it generalizes perfectly well. So this was observed by Rockland in the case of constant coefficient operators on the Heisenberg group, proven by um, Helfer and Nuriga in that situation of uh, simply connected Milpotent Lie groups, uh, filtered Milpotent Lie groups, uh, and then generalized by many other people. Uh, I won't list them all here now because I notice that I'm running short on time. So uh, I'll mention their names perhaps later. Um, here are some of them. Uh, the, the big theorem is that uh, these Rockland operators, just like the classical elliptic operators, are hypoelliptic operators. Uh, so Mellin proved this in full generality in for filtered manifolds, which is the situation I'm talking about here. But he never published this work. So this is back in 1984. He wrote a preprint where he proved this by introducing some pseudo differential calculus, a bit like the calculus of Bills and Greiner. But he never actually published this work. Um, so this uh, sort of remained in this uh, unpublished state until quite recently when Dave uh, and Haller uh, finished the proof uh, using the, the pseudo differential calculus that I'm about to um, describe here now. So let's go on with this. Oh, let's do some examples first. So let's take Kolmogorov's operator from um, the start of this talk. So I'm going to take uh, M, which is R3, and I'm going to filter it um, first by d by dx. So that's going to be an order one vector field. Then by adding x d by z, x d by dz plus d by dy, which will be an order two vector field. And then uh, the whole tangent space will be of degree three. So in this sense, M, is a filtered manifold and in fact the osculating groups are just the Heisenberg group in fact M itself is a Heisenberg group here uh, and the principal part of this operator will be the operator x squared plus y and you can do the representation theory for this guy very easily uh, the representation theory for Heisenberg group is not at all complicated and you find that it's Rockland and so it's indeed uh, a hypoelliptic operator which Kolmogorov had already proved almost 100 years ago so this is nothing new but it's a, a new way of seeing 
seeing this. Uh, a second example would be the subreplacing on CR manifold. So here again, I take M to be the boundary of a pseudo, strongly pseudo complex domain. And I'm going to filter it just with depth two now. Uh, I'm going to take the order one vectors to be the hyperplane bundle, the contact hyperplane bundle, and then T, the order two vector fields is everything. Uh, so again, this is a filtered manifold. And again, we get a Heisenberg group uh, as the osculating groups, uh, now of dimension 2n plus 1. And the principal part of the sub Laplacian is just the sum of the xi's squared, where here the xi's are the generating vector fields for the hyperplane bundle, the cotangent, I think the, the, the co dimension 1 contact bundle. And again, uh, a bit of simple analysis on the Heisenberg group shows that these are all invertible away from the trivial representation. And so again, we get a Rockland operator, and this again proves now Cohn and uh, Fulman and Stein's results about uh, hypoellipticity of these uh, subreplacings. Okay, so I told you that you can do this using the tangent groupoid, so I need to tell you how the tangent groupoid works in this case. So it's very simple. We just take exactly the picture we had before, but we reinterpret the t equals zero phi, but now it's not just the ordinary tangent bundle, but it's this bundle of osculating groups. It's this bundle of simply connected nilpotent Lie groups. The smooth structure is exactly the same. Uh, I use the same chart, except that now, um, instead of slowing down my vector fields by xi, I slow them down by some inhomogeneous, some filtered dilations. So vector fields of order one will be dilated by t, or shrunk by t, uh, whereas vector fields of order two will be shrunk by t squared, uh, t, t, uh, vector fields of order three by t cubed, and so on and so forth. Uh, but this also defines a smooth structure on this object. Uh, so now, as I was just saying, these dt delta t's are the homogeneous dilations. Uh, and the groupoid structure is also exactly the same, except instead of uh, adding tangent vectors, I now use the group law in the osculating groups. Uh, so again, it's a very simple object. Again, it has this de Bord's this action that I've indicated in green in this picture. And uh, here's what we end up with. So we can make this definition of the fat psi m just like we did previously for the classical pseudo differential operators. So these are families of distributions on the tangent groupoid fat TM, which are homogeneous mod C infinity M, which would be C infinity TM, excuse me. And uh, we have two maps, a restriction to T equals one and a restriction to T equals zero. And I'm gonna call the images of those maps um, psi M at T equals one and sigma M at T equals zero. And what this gives us is a pseudo differential calculus for uh, filtered manifolds so following Bills and Greiner and uh, Melin. I should also mention Chris uh, Geller, Grolatsky, and Paulin, who worked on this, and many other people, Taylor, uh, Epstein, Melrose. Uh, there's a, a long history of this um, in various different circumstances. And the theorem is that uh, if this restriction at t equals zero, which I'm calling now uh, the sigma m of p, the principal co symbol, if that is invertible in this convolution algebra on the osculating groups, then uh, given all the things that we've proven before, it's not at all difficult to show that P then admits a parametrix Q uh, in the operators of order minus M, um, modulo one degree lower, but then with the standard Norman series trick modulo smoothing operators in fact, so that we have um, a, a parametrix modulo smoothing. Uh, this condition that I've described about the invertibility of the principal co-symbol is awkward to work with. Uh, it's some abstract convolution algebra of distributions on um, nilpotent Lie groups. Um, so as I was saying, Dave and Haller finished off the proof of this by proving on that this abstract invertibility condition in terms of the restriction of t equals zero actually corresponds precisely to the pointwise Rockland condition. So here they're building on work, uh, previous work of uh, Folland and Stein and Raphael Ponge and uh, Chris Geller, Dawaski and Polin and various other people who proved it in other circumstances. Um, but it, it, it does finish off precisely this, this theorem that uh, if you have a, a, an operator on a Lie filtered manifold, which satisfies the pointwise Rockland condition, then its principal co-symbol is invertible and therefore it admits a parametrics and that's enough to prove 
I told it to city. So as a corollary, we get Millen's theorem from 1984, which proves that pointwise Lockland operators are indeed Fred Holm operators. And I think that's probably a good place to finish. So thanks very much. Lost the I, I actually have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, it's a question from an algebraist person, so I'm, I'm sorry about this question. So I'm used to the categorical definition of groupoid. So I was wondering, uh, uh, from this point of view, does it give any advantage? Have you seen this uh, point of view more categorical about what you're doing? Uh, yeah, so no, this is really a geometric kind of groupoid. It's, you should okay, it's think of it as... You should think of it as some kind of generalization of a, a Lie group uh, with the caveat that you're not allowed to compose any two no, no, of course elements. I know what the yeah. group point is. Of course. Yeah, sorry, sorry. But, but there's, very, there's very little, the, the objects here are really geometric in nature. There's no algebraic structure underlying these objects. There is no just, advantage in, in trying to exploit this. I'm sorry about this. No. I know it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's no problem. Sorry, I didn't mean to fine, fine. Um, repeat you. the definition of a groupoid. But yeah, no, it's really about flows. So these groupoids are used to describe, I mean, they pop up in so work of Kohn, but also in work of Andrew Lidakis and Skandalis describing flows on foliations and, and so on. Um, no, it makes so it's sense. A very, it's a very geometric thing. but it makes sense, yes. Okay, so any other questions? As then Not maybe uh, as a continuation of the written questions, do you know something about uh, the corresponding Lie algebraids to this case? Yeah, so the Lie algebraids are precisely, um, yeah. the, the Lie algebraids are, are, in fact, it's easier to construct the Lie algebraids than the Lie algebraids. So the Lie algebraid will be um, at every t non zero, the Lie algebraid will just be the tangent bundle to the manifold. So it's very simple. And uh, except that the anchor will be non-trivial, the anchor will be the well, the, yeah, the anchor will be the map from the tangent bundle into itself, so the the identities. Uh, and at the t equals zero fiber, um, the Lie algebraid will be the bundle of Lie algebras um, with a zero anchor. Okay. So it, it's actually much easier to describe this. So the Lie algebraid is something very algebraic. You just take the the, the tangent bundle Tm with the um with its filtration and there's a sort of standard deformation from a filtered object to a graded object where you multiply uh things of filtration order k by t to the k and that gives you a, a natural deformation family that moves from the filtered object to the graded object and that is, that is precisely the, the Lie algebra so it's actually a very simple object the Lie algebra mm, okay thanks Interesting. And I, I have another question that probably more technical. Uh, so my favorite uh, set of the differential operators either came from Lex operators or recursion operators for nonlinear PDEs. Is this approach could give me some some ideas to simplify my life? For example, yeah, that, sorry, keep going. Yeah, for example, when I have a Lex operator, I don't know, for KDV, when it's dx plus my potential u, I want to take a square root of it and then produce my integrable hierarchy. Could I use some techniques from this uh, groupoid approach? Yeah, um, so that is a technical question, and I don't know the answer to it. So first of all, at the, the nonlinear side, I know almost nothing about nonlinear uh, differential operators. So um, that, I think, is an interesting question, but I have unfortunately nothing to say about it um for operators with um you'll have to fill me in a bit for operators with um with potentials are you thinking of some analog of the vial calculus here or something like that so uh, i don't know these lex operators either um not really because uh, let's start with this uh, operator that will give me kdv it's it will be d uh, dx plus potential u Mm -hmm. And I want to take a square root of it mm -hmm. and then take some powers of it. Right. And, uh, it yeah, so in this, the, the, the potential plays a non-trivial role here, right? So um, yes, yes. 
it becomes a non-local problem now. So this is extremely interesting question, I think. Um, but for the moment I have, so, so the, the pseudo differential calculi that we're obtaining here are completely local in nature. Um, <coughs> so I, at the moment, none of this says anything about, um, you know, Fred Holmness for operators with potential on non-compact manifolds or anything like that. Um, something I've started vaguely thinking about, but uh, for, the, for the moment I, I don't have any concrete, anything okay. concrete uh, in that direction. Yeah, thanks. So I think, Marco, did you raise your hand for a question? Yeah, so <clears throat> are there a local index formula for this filter case? Yeah, uh, so, oh, local index formula. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can get index formula very easily. Well, formula, you can get index theorems very easily in the sort of yeah. abstract sense of con. And then you want to be able to turn that into um, an actual index formula in terms of yeah, you characteristic see the classes classes classes, like classes, yeah. yeah, so there are some of these. So Eric has proved uh, an index formula of this kind for Heisenberg manifolds. Mm -hmm. And I think Omar Mosen recently generalized that um, somewhat. So I need to check exactly how easy it is to extract that. I mean, the difficulty is extracting the appropriate symbol classes from the principal symbol data. Um, so somehow there is a general recipe that one could follow and just run the machine. And... Yeah, it's not so simple as that. So in Eric's proof, for instance, he uses the non-commutative geometry of the representation space of the Heisenberg group, mm. um, which, as you maybe know, has this kind of symplectic structure. It's like a, a three-sphere with, uh, sorry, a two-sphere with... Um, two with the two hemispheres being a single symplectic leaf and then a bunch of points around uh, the equator okay. yeah. and using the structure of the principal symbols on these different components they're able to compute or to give a formula for uh, an me phi cycle in the sense of full bound uh, and once you have that, you can put it into the traditional Atiyah Singer theorem uh, formula and, and get an index out of it. But already, you know, it's quite yeah. a lot of work to, to get there. It really needs, I, I, I think it could be possible in general, but I think it would also be extremely difficult to give sort of a, a straight write it down formula. It's more like a process that you need to go through yeah. um, to obtain the, the, the bound Douglas, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the, the Baum Douglas uh, cycle. So you say that somehow in the case of the Heisen in the Heisenberg case, then it has to do with this uh, symplectic foliation uh, of the Heisenberg. So let's yeah, say of the, the co the the the, um, the Colbert space basically. So you look at the Colbert space of the, the Heisenberg Lie algebra, and this yeah. has some symplectic structure, and you restrict to the sphere at infinity, and yeah, there's some functional analysis which allows you to turn those guys into local index data. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a fairly long process. Uh, so Omar Mosen has been thinking about this and he's made some, some progress in general. Okay, so are there any more questions? Yeah, I think there's a question, Eska, but we can't hear you, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I can't hear. I'm not sure there must be a technical problem with the mic. I, um, I can almost, I can hear vague noise. Eska, can you type it into the chat and then I can read it out?
Yeah, t today hasn't been the best day, technically. <laughs> uh, here we go. Okay, so you can probably read it yourself, but if one is given a hypoelliptic differential operator, is there any hope we can construct a pseudo differential calculus out of it that explains why it is hypoelliptic? Like, for example, constructing a tangent groupoid with an R star action. Yeah, so that's also an interesting question. So the first thing you might ask is how you know if it's hypoelliptic. Uh, you need some kind of proof. So to my knowledge, there are only two ways, people can, can correct me if I'm wrong, there are only two ways to know whether an operator, a differential operator is hypoelliptic or not. One is with the Rockland theorem. So in that case, it's already dealt with here. The other is with uh, Hormand of sum of squares theorem. Um, and uh, so I'm working on another project with Jakob Osandro Lidakis and Omar Mosen and Eric Van Erp again. Um, to obtain a groupoid proof also for sums of squares operators. So sums of squares operators, you sort of have a given family of vector fields which are uh, generating for, uh, which are bracket generating, and there you can find a tangent groupoid associated to those differential operators, uh, which is now more singular. It won't be a Lie groupoid anymore. It'll be some kind of Diffeological group order is the technical name, so it'll be something like a non Hausdorff manifold. Um, and uh, you can use the same general principles with that. It seems there are some details missing, but you can use the same general principle to prove that, that those are, are pseudo differential, uh, that those are hypoelliptic, uh, and that there's an associated pseudo differential calculus. So, um, yeah, I don't know whether that answers the question, but I. Um, I think it's more you need to know that there's a pseudo differential calculus associated to the differential operator to prove that it's hypoelliptic, um, except for the example of these sums of squares operators. Okay, great. Uh, so, yes, thank you is the answer if you haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah, I saw that <laughs> pop up. Okay, so are there any other questions? Maybe I'll quickly then ask, I mean, the obvious question for me is going to be, what about extending these things to differential operators on quantum, coming from quantum? Yeah, groups? so that would be fun. So Nigel uh, Higson and one of his students, uh, whose name is, oh, I've forgotten his name, that's terrible. Uh, it'll come to me shortly. They have a way of constructing the tangent group word, which is very algebraic in nature. So it's rather than starting with the geometry of the manifold, they just start with the algebra of functions. Uh, and then they, you can sort of imagine being able to blow this up using some algebraic geometry type constructions to obtain an algebra of functions on what should be the tangent group word. And then the classical case this works out. So you can imagine applying that to your favorite you know, say quantum homogeneous space or whatever okay. you like, and then make the definition that uh, that Eric and I have made here and see what it gives you. Um, uh, that, I think that's an interesting thing to think about, and I haven't I haven't thought about that at all, yeah. except that you know it'd be fun to try. Because um, we have enough examples to know that should be. Yeah, I mean, you'd start with the Podler sphere, of course, and just, yeah, of course. you know, first of all, can you define what the tangent group point of the Podler sphere is? I think that's already, um, already could be fun to do. Uh, it, it's strange there because the differential operators on the Podler sphere and on these other quantum spaces, they look more like difference operators sometimes than they do yeah, like yeah, differential yeah, yeah. operators. Yeah. Uh, so like Q differential operators. So I don't know, yeah, I don't know what would happen when you, when you deform that to equal zero by one of these block constructions. It's an interesting question. Something to think about. Yeah, homework problem. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think maybe that's that's probably about it. I think you've got enough of the grilling. Uh, yeah, so okay. we'd, uh, thank you very much again for a very nice talk. And so, yeah, Karen has just put up on the screen next week's talk, uh, which is Hannes Thiel from the Technische Universität Dresden, uh, the generator rank of a sister of sister algebras. So that's next week's talk, same place, same time. Great, well, thanks very much.
That's see it. you all around. Yeah, we'll see you around. Okay. Bye, everyone. Okay, bye, everyone.